Hi, so in the previous video we looked at adding the government into our neoclassical model and then we looked at what happens when we make changes and more specifically increases in government spending in our neoclassical model. Now in this video we're going to look at changes in government spending in the Keynesian model. So for starters, in our Keynesian model we need to remember what our Keynesian consumption function is and this says that consumption in period one is equal to some constant plus this fraction beta of disposable income. In the past we saw this as just being some constant multiplied by income but now we've added government spending and taxation we look at disposable income so we take tax or this lump sum tax T1 away from our income y1 and this beta can be viewed as the marginal propensity to consume. So now that we have our consumption function we can begin to think about what happens when we make changes in this model. So <clears throat> to start we can begin thinking about a permanent change in government spending and in much the same way as in the neoclassical model or our intertemporal choice model we were looking at, uh, we will have this permanent change in government spending is equal to a, an equal change in tax revenue in each period of time. And instead of having this generally as being a change, in this video we're going to look at an increase in government spending and thus taxation. It would be very much similar if we were looking at a decrease in government spending but of course it would just be the opposite as we would be decreasing things. So in our Keynesian model to start to analyze what will happen when we change this government spending we need to know that in the Keynesian model individuals are not forward-looking and we do not have the same micro foundations of the model as we have in the neoclassical model. In Keynes's model, he just makes a number of assumptions about how variables behave at the macroeconomic level. So we don't have the same sort of intuition as we had in the last video in looking at these shifts. Instead, we just have to use his Keynesian consumption function for aggregate demand, and our aggregate supply is given by some production function. So let's think about a permanent increase in government spending well we still have that our aggregate demand depends on our government spending and um, we can we can put this as a function our aggregate demand function as a function still of the interest rate and not the present value of income that would be a mistake because individuals are not forward-looking in the Keynesian model so in fact we just have that they make decisions based on their current income. So we're no longer doing present value or discounting period two income. In the Keynesian model, individuals do not care about their future income, they only care about their income today. So we increase government spending. The initial effect is going to be very similar to in our neoclassical model. We shift out our aggregate demand curve to the right by this change in government spending. Change in G, um, we know that our aggregate demand is given by C plus I plus G, we can, we can write it as. Uh, so an increase in government spending is going to shift our aggregate demand out. We are spending money on purchasing things, so we've increased demand. However, as we see in our aggregate demand function, this depends on our current value of income, and as I've said in this Keynesian consumption function, our aggregate demand does depend on this tax revenue. So we're going to have, in a similar way to how we had previously, we are going to have a reduction in demand, which is caused by this increase in lump sum taxes, causing a reduction in consumption. So we shift the curve back to this point here. This shift is not the same magnitude as the change in government spending, and this comes from the nature of our Keynesian consumption function, and that we have 
a marginal propensity to consume on this consumption, which is given by beta here. So if we think about our uh, aggregate demand function, we've got that I'm just highlighting now, uh, we have our aggregate demand is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending. By increasing government spending, we just increase this parameter by some amount of government spending, increase in G. So this shifts the curve to the right by this increase in G. However, if we look at our change in taxes or our increase in tax, this enters into this consumption function, but it enters into the consumption function in, as I'll expand out this consumption function that we have at the top of the screen and it enters in like this. So as you can see, this change in taxes only factors into consumption with some fraction. It does affect our aggregate demand negatively, but for every increase or every one unit increase in government spending, if we increase, increase G by one, we have to increase our tax by one, but our uh, the impact that increasing tax by one has on consumption is that it will decrease consumption only by a factor of beta. So we decrease consumption by beta, our marginal propensity to consume. So the shift left given by the tax revenue is slightly smaller than the increase in government spending. And so our overall shift from the overall effect of this government spending and taxation is that our aggregate demand curve does shift to the right overall. Um, so the government is spending all of this money that it takes in tax, whereas the money it's taken off consumers, they wouldn't have spent all of that money. They only spend a fraction of it. So by spending money, we have an increase in aggregate demand in the economy. And that's what Keynes's model says. And now in the neoclassical model, we ha would then have that consumers would choose to work more in this economy because they've had some income taken off them. And we showed this in the previous video as a static labor and consumption choice that as we decrease their income, there was an income effect that caused people to work more. And this was a sort of effect that they had. They wanted to compensate for the loss in income they've had because of this increase in taxes. However, the Keynesian aggregate supply function is not micro-founded in this way. We don't think about individual choices in the same way. So we don't actually think of individuals as then making this decision to work more. That is just not part of the model. It's not modeled at all. Instead, our supply is, we can just come up with some production function or it's, it's kind of beyond the scope of what we look at when we're thinking about this model at the moment. So the supply doesn't shift at all and we're actually done at this point here. So we have a new equilibrium because of the fact that we haven't micro-founded and this is why some people have an issue and say in the 1970s and beyond there was a bit of a fight back against Keynesian economics because it wasn't backed up by economic theory and it was this sort of issue that people had but in the Keynesian model this is what he this is what Keynes says that if we increase government spending we are going to have an increase in output and an increase in our interest rate. When we have a permanent increase in government spending, this is what happens. So now we can go and look at what happens when we have a temporary increase in government spending in our Keynesian model. So I will draw up another set of axes. Let me get this in black. So just going to draw up again exactly the same set of axes with interest rate and output on each axis, the same way as we have done in previous videos. Whoops, that should be interest rate in period one and output in period one. And exactly the same as before, we have some demand curve and we have some aggregate supply curve. Let's just note down what our initial equilibrium was so we can look at the changes. 
And OK, so now we are going to do a temporary change in government spending. So let's just write that down to be for clearness temporary increase in government spending that is equal to a temporary increase in lump sum taxation. So in period one, we increase our government spending by some, some amount. So this will cause a shift to the right of our aggregate demand function by this change in G, exactly the same as before. And but this increase in taxes is going to enter into our period one consumption. And it's going to enter in in this way, exactly the same again. Why is it exactly the same? In the previous video with the neoclassical model, we had that this change or this shift due to taxes was different in the temporary and permanent models. But it is not different in the neoclassical model because agents are not forward looking. Our consumption function, our say consumption demand, it depends on the interest rate and our current value of income, which is Y1 minus T1. In the neoclassical model, we would have this consumption function that depended on the present value of income. And it seems like a subtle difference, but it does make a difference in how much we shift our curves. So this is Keynes and this is neoclassical or the model we've been looking at in all the previous videos in this series. So in the neoclassical model, we with a permanent change in taxes, we would factor that into our model and say, OK, our income is changing. Well, let's say for a temporary change in taxes, we say we, we know we've got an increase in taxes today, but in the future, our taxes are going to go back to what they were before. So we could smooth our consumption over time. And so we would bring some more of that consumption into today. And this is why we had a differing shift in the curves in between temporary and permanent changes in government spending. But in the Keynesian model, they don't care about whether this is a temporary or a permanent change. They only think about their income to today. So they only depend on current income. And there's not much more to explain about that, really. It is basically just a different assumption that we have in different models. So we just need to be very clear on what each model assumes. And when we're in the Keynesian model, we are only looking at current income and we are not forward looking. So actually, that caps off this, this example as well. This is our new equilibrium, R2 star and Y2 star. Again, we don't have a shift in the aggregate supply because this is not a micro funded model. So everything is exactly the same. And it's exactly the same, as I've said multiple times, but the, just to be clear, it's because individuals are not forward looking. So things being temporary and things being permanent, it doesn't matter in the Keynesian model because as, uh, as you can see on these diagrams, we are focusing on R1 and Y1. We're only looking at period one uh, interest rates and outputs. We're looking at period one government spending. And individuals don't care about the future. So in period one, a temporary effect is going to be exactly the same as a permanent effect. If we were then to look at period two, things would change a little bit. But we're not in this example. So this is why in period one, our temporary and permanent changes in government spending are exactly the same and so they increase our interest rate and they increase our output so fiscal policy is not neutral we can stimulate aggregate demand by spending as a government and this is why Keynesian economics prescribes that governments in a recession should spend to help us get out of the recession so that will just about wrap up this video uh, check out the playlist for future videos on topics such as this. Subscribe for lots of other future videos on economics and make sure to like if this video was at all useful.